um, usually at the beginning of the first class of any course, I, I quote a few lines of poetry from Imam Shafi'i, rahimahullah ta'ala. So if you've heard this before, uh, it's fine. It's always a good reminder. So Imam Shafi'i said, uh, he said, Shakotu ila waqi'in su'a hivdi. He said, I complain to my teacher, waqi'ir, because of my inability to remember things. Okay, this is Imam Shafi'i, who is a mujtahid, right? With 100,000 hadith memorized. But he's complaining to us. Now, the, the ulama say that Imam Shafi'i, uh, uh, one time he passed by a woman and he looked at her ankle and he felt his memory slipping. So this, then he, com he composed these lines of poetry. He says, Shakotu ila waqi'in su'a hivdi fa'arshadni ila tark al-ma'asi. So he exhorted me to give up ma'asi, evil deeds, bad sins, right? Wa akhbarani bi anna al-'ilma nurun, and he informed me that knowledge is light, munurullahi la yuhda li'asi. And uh, the light of God is not bestowed upon the sinner. Right? So, uh, you know, we wonder why we can't remember things. Imagine what we look at. Right? And he saw an ankle and he, and he felt his memory slipping. Right? So if we're going to take a class like this, we have to guard the inroads to the heart. There's seven inroads to the heart. And for the male, the quickest inroad is through the eyes. Right? There's a hadith that says that if a man is gazing at something haram, his iman is pulled, is, is uh, extracted from his eyes as long as he's gazing at that haram thing. Right? So it's a serious issue. And so we have to remember that. This is extremely important. And then another hadith that says, I'm paraphrasing of course, that uh, a man who turns away from something haram and then feels that pain in his heart, right? Because he wanted to look at that thing, right? Uh, the Prophet wasallam said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will convert that pain into a light, right? So keep that in mind, inshallah ta'ala. So last time um, we did the... Uh, the lineage of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I hope everyone has a book, or a few people have books. You can look on with your neighbor or something. Um, so it's it's not essential, but it's very uh, highly recommended that we get the textbook. So we're going to start by giving a historical context um, of the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It's called the late antiquity, his time frame. It's called Late Antiquity. And I'm going to be quoting and paraphrasing from a book by uh, Stephen Mulberger. It's called An Overview of Late Antiquity in the Hellenistic World. Okay, this is a text that graduate students, Christian graduate students read in Christian seminaries, right? They're doing postgraduate studies. So he says here it was, a, it was a period of massive destruction, imperial warfare, and barbarian invasions. It's called the Dark Ages of Humanity, right? Al Ursul Dhulma, the Dark Ages of humanity. So we think of the verse which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, right? He it is who sends who sends blessings upon you as do his angels, that he may bring you from darkness into light. Right? Um, so he says here that barbarian mercenaries like Franks and Lombards and the Goths and the Gauls, they were attacking the empire and the region became completely destabilized. So the emperor of the Greek East at the time was uh, Justinian II. Okay, so um, just a very quick um, overview that the, the Christian Roman Empire was divided into two regions, the Greek East and the Latin West. And they both had capitals. The capital of the Greek East was in Constantinople, which is today Istanbul in Turkey. Right? The capital of the Latin West was Rome, right? the Bishop of Rome, which is now the Pope. So there's a hadith of the Prophet Wasallam that uh, Islam will enter into these two cities and convert them to Islam, right? So in 1453 of the Common Era, Muhammad al-Fatih, rahimahullah ta'ala, he conquered uh, Constantinople, right? And Rome has yet to convert, right? inshallah ta'ala. Um, so during this time, he basically says, there was massive doctrinal differences amongst Christians. And just to put a few dates on the board, um, that we should remember. So 
these are all common era. Does, any, does everyone understand common era? You're not supposed to say AD. You know, sometimes people say AD. You know what AD means? It means in, Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord, right? So CE is better. Christian era or common era. So these dates are common era, right? You notice here that this date here is about 17 years prior to the birth of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. All right, so 324 was a council called Nicaea. Okay. Uh, this was also in Turkey, modern day Turkey. So this was the first uh, so-called ecumenical or world council that the churches held, that the Roman Empire held. Which bishops were invited and it was here in 324 in which they took a vote. It was quite literally by vote. And they voted to make Isa alayhi salam equal with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? Mm -hmm. 324 of the common era. So this is about 300 years after Isa alayhi salam walked the earth. They took a vote, an official vote, <coughs> and that's what happened. Now in 381, this was at Constantinople. Okay? 381, a few years later, uh, 324 was presided over by Constantine I, 381, Emperor Theodosius. 381, they voted again, and they declared that the Ruh al-Qudus, right, the Holy Spirit, is also equal with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Isa alayhi salam. Okay? So this is three, about 350 years after Isa alayhi salam. 421, at the Council of Ephesus, 421, Ephesus, they voted and they de declared Maryam alayhi salam theotokos, which means hasha lillah, the mother of God. Hasha lillah, right? 421. So you can see here that Christian theology is evolving over time, right? It's very clear. There's an, there's an evolution of what's known as Christology or belief about Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. You know, it's not like Isa alayhi salam taught this doctrine and there it is, right? I mean, religions evolve over time, Islam evolves over time as well. But we're talking about major, major tenets of belief, major doctrine being meted out at these councils. There's nothing like this in our in our tradition. Yeah, 451. Council of Chalcedon. It was at this council where they voted again, where Isa alayhi salam was declared to have a dual nature. That he's not only 100% man, but he's also 100% God at the same time, which of course makes 200%. Right? <laughs> and then 553, Second Council of Constantinople. This is when Origen was condemned. Uh, and this is when those Christians who do not believe that Jesus had a dual nature were condemned. So this is in 553 of the Common Era, 17 years before the birth of the Prophet wasallam. Still having councils, still trying to determine what is orthodoxy, what is heterodoxy, what is permissible to believe in, what is impermissible to believe in. What should we believe about Isa alayhi salam? What should we believe about uh, the Holy Spirit? Okay. So he says here that this was a time beginning in the 540s where recurrent epidemics of bubonic plague reduced the population to its lowest in centuries. So there's a play going around the Christian Roman Empire. And of course, they believe this was a curse from God, right? Now, science today tells us that the, the reason for the plague was because uh, of, of rats and fleas. And the Jews in the empire were not getting the plague, right? Because Jews have tahara, they, they, they clean and things like that. There's a concept in their religion. It's very similar to us. So they weren't dying from the plague, so the Jews were blamed for it. Right? <laughs> it's very interesting. And then he says here, there was major religious conflict. Okay? Anti-Jewish policies at the outset of the reign had consequences beyond the frontier. The king of Himyar, which is in Yemen, a Jewish convert, closed off access to the Indian Ocean and was oppressing Christians in his kingdom. Right? Qutila al-Ashab al Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to this in the Quran, Surah Al-Fajr. Right? The Jewish king in Yemen. And there was a crusade and so on and so forth. And then he says here, throughout the 6th century, uh, rulers and communities identified themselves with a religious position and aligned themselves with others on ideological ground. In short, the world was in chaos and they were looking to religion. Right? And as the Quran says, قَدْ جَاءَكُمْ 
Nurun min Allahi wa kitabun mubin. And at this time, a light came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a clear book. And the exegetes, the mufassirin of the Quran, the commentators of the Quran, have said that Nur in this ayah is a direct reference to the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. There's hadith that indicate that the Prophet sallallahu light was the first entity that was created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is not a wajib belief, but this is something that the, the Ash'ari theologians will stress. It's called the reality of the Muhammadan nature or the priority of the Muhammadan light. It's based on sound tradition where the Prophet sallallahu uh, was asked, مَتَا كُنْتَ نَبِيًّا When did you become a prophet? And he said, uh, he said, Adam kana Adamu bayna turabi wa bayna ma'in aw bayna ruh wal jasad that Adam was between uh, dirt and water or between his body and uh, his soul. And I was made the, the, the seal of the prophets. Right? There's other indications as well. There's a hadith in the uh, Musannaf of Abu Bakr al-San'ani, uh, which is a Hassan hadith, a strong hadith, where uh, Jabir came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Ya Rasulullah, what was the first entity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created? And he said, the light of your Prophet ﷺ. Okay? But that's not a, like we said, it's not an obligatory belief. Um, so now, beginning with the text. So Martin Lings, or Sheikh Abu Bakr al-Siraj, rahimahullah ta'ala, he begins uh, his book with a chapter called The House of God, right, the Bayt Allah. And he quotes extensively from the Bible, from the Torah, from the book of Berishit, which is the book of Genesis, Kitabu Taqween in the Arabic translation. So he says here that uh, he outlines the all important covenant that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made with Ibrahim alayhi salam. So covenants are very important in Judeo Christian Islamic tradition, right? Agreements or pacts, a mithaq, right? There's many covenants that are mentioned in the Quran, right? Uh, right? We took from the Prophets. Their covenant, wa minka, wa min Nuh, wa Ibrahim, wa Musa, wa Isa ibn Maryam. We took it from the, the five ulul azm, the most exalted prophets. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took a covenant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Surah Ali Imran, ayah number 81, that he took a covenant from the prophets, Adam alayhi salam to Isa alayhi salam. That if I send to you my prophet, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu the beloved of God, you must forsake your mission and follow him. Right? Uh, so there's many types of, of covenants mentioned in the Quran. So Genesis chapter 15. There are, there are two vital stipulations of the covenant of Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. The first one is that the, that the chosen seed of Abraham, of Ibrahim alayhi salam, will be as numerous as the stars. Right? And then it says that all of the land between the two great rivers, which are the Nile and the Euphrates, will be given to the seed of Abraham, will be conquered and converted. So if you look at, this is the Mediterranean, this is Egypt, this is uh, Sinai, this is the Nile, right? this is Euphrates, oh, it's actually, it's more up over here. Around there. Okay? So all of this land, right, will be conquered by the chosen seed of Ibrahim alayhi salam, according to the covenant. Now what is this land? In Egypt, you have Al Hijaz, the Arabian Peninsula, you have all of Sham, you have parts of Iraq. Right? So what we have here is Israel. Right? So the Jews believe, or the Zionists believe, that all of this land is greater Israel. Right? This is all of their land. This is what the Zionists believe, based on this stipulation of Ibrahim alayhi salam, or the covenant of Ibrahim alayhi salam, because they don't believe that the seed of Ismail alayhi salam is a legitimate seed. So if you've ever seen the Israeli flag, you know, you have the Star of David, and then you have two blue lines, right? These blue lines are the two rivers. The Nile and Euphrates, and you have the state of Israel in the middle. Right. So, um, and then he says, um, 
Then he quotes from Genesis 17, out of Ismail alayhi salam, I'll make a great nation of him. Now interestingly, if you look at all of the children of Ibrahim alayhi salam, most of them are progenitors of Arab tribes. So uh, according to tradition, he had three wives at least. Uh, Hajira, Hagar, and Ismail alayhi salam, who is obviously the father of Arabs. He had another wife, Keturah, who had a wife, uh, who had a son, Midian, who's also a, a, an ancestor of Arabs. And then uh, Sarah had uh, Isaac and Esau. Esau, according to Christian sources, is also a father of Arabs. It's only the children of Jacob, right, that are called Bani Israel, that are Israelites. So only one of his grandsons are considered Israelites. So obviously this doesn't fit the description or stipulation in the covenant that they'll be numerous as the stars, right? And history shows the ineptness of Bani Israel to conquer these lands. In fact, they began worshiping idols even on the Temple Mount on Beit al-Maqdis. But if you look at Islamic history, 637 Jerusalem is conquered, 641 uh, Antioch in Syria. These are major centers of Christianity, right? Um, a few years later, you have uh, Alexandria in Egypt, 707 all of North Africa, by 711 uh, Spain at Andalusia, right? So the Christian polemicists will, might say, well, that's because Islam was spread by the sword. You know, there's a book called Answering Islam. I don't know if you heard of it. There's a website now, but it used to be a book in 1993. This man, Norman Geisler, wrote a book, Answering Islam. In that book, he actually says that uh, the reason why these tribes in North Africa converted was because of low taxes that the Muslims were charging and their stress on brotherhood. So even he admits, and he's a hardcore Christian polemicist, that this whole myth about spread by the sword is indeed a myth. It's not true. Of course, he's not willing to say that, you know, these people actually believed in Islam. There must have been a monetary benefit or something, right? Low taxes or stress on brotherhood and actually believe in it. But that's what we believe, right? So um, he also quotes here from Genesis 21, which states that, um, according to the Israelite tradition, that uh, Hagar and Ismail were banished into the desert, right? Um, and this was supposed to happen on the day of Isaac's weaning. A child is weaned in Israelite tradition at three years old. And we are told, according to tradition, that when Isaac was born, Ishaq alayhi salam was born, Ibrahim alayhi salam was 86 years old. And when Ismail alayhi salam was born, he was 100 years old. That means on the day of Isaac's weaning, Ismail alayhi salam was 17 years old, which is a grown man, right? Yet when we read the tradition or the story in the, in the Torah, in the book of Genesis, chapter 21, we're given the profile of an infant. It says, Abraham took the child and set him upon her shoulder, and she carried him into the wilderness, and he started crying. So she had to put him down underneath a shrub, and he was kicking his feet. And then uh, God came and said to her, lift him up in your hand. Right? This is a profile of an infant. So the ulama have said, and this is what the Jewish scholars have said as well. Uh, they're very candid about these things. Judeo-Christian scholars of higher biblical criticism. So they'll say that the chronologies of these things were deliberately manipulated in order to implicate that there was fitna in the Ahlul Bayt of Ibrahim alayhi salam. When in reality, there was no banishment into the desert. Right? There was no animosity between the two brothers. Imam Suyuti says that Ibrahim was seven years old. Either way, he wouldn't know Ishaq alayhi salam for many years. Right? And then he says here that Mecca was 40 days by camel from Canaan, from Canaan. And this is where Ibrahim alayhi salam lived, in Canaan. Um, he also mentions here that they probably hitched a ride on the, on the incense route. So Luban, right? Frankincense, frankincense or myrrh. This was the commercial base for the Arabs. It was used in temples and weddings and funeral. Um, there was a famous trade route that went from Sham to Yemen, right, through the valley of Becca. And then he, cite, he, he quotes a verse from the Psalms, which is probably the Zabur, Allahu Alam. Psalm 84, 6, which speaks of a pilgrimage uh, that the Bani Israel used to make to a place called Becca, right? And the, that's the word in the Hebrew, Bakka. Uh, this word is also in the Quran, in awwal adaytin, wudi alin nasi lalladhi bi Bakka ta mubaraka. That this was the first house that was dedicated to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So and, and according to Ibn Ishaq, there was a time when Bani Israel, 
because they were the Muslim Ummah at the time, they used to come into Mecca for Hajj, right? In fact, the Hebrew word for Hajj, uh, which is spelled like this, Hag, they use a gimel, they don't have a gene sound, like the Egyptian dialect. This word actually means to circumambulate in its etymology. But Jews today, they don't circumambulate anything. But the word pilgrimage, Hag, which is the cognate of Hajj, means to circumambulate, to go around, make tawaf. Right, so Ibn Ishaq says in his Sirah, Sirat Rasulullah, that the Bani Israel used to make pilgrimage to Mecca, but then they stopped because a Moabite idol named Hubal uh, was brought by a man named Amr bin Lu'ay. So when this man brought this idol from, from Syria, uh, the Bani Israel stopped making Hajj, stopped coming to Mecca. Right, But there's indications in this Psalm 84.6, or Dawood alayhi salam, if he wrote this, Allahu alam, it's, it's attributed to him, where he describes a pilgrimage to this place called Becca, the Weeping Valley. Right? So Becca, like in Arabic, Baka yabki, buka'an. He cried. Right? Baka, he cried. This is where Ismail alayhi salam cried. Right? The Weeping Valley. And then he describes a well. There was a well in this, in this psalm. So this is Martin Links. He quotes this in the first chapter. Um, Genesis 22 says that Ibrahim a.s. was going to sacrifice Ishaq a.s. There is an ikhtilaf amongst Muslim ulama, right? Whether it was Ibrahim, whether it was Ishaq a.s. or Ismail a.s. It's not a major issue for us, and we shouldn't make it a major issue. So it really doesn't matter. We have to look at the ibra. What's the lesson of the story? Right? It doesn't matter which son it was. For the Jews, it's extremely important which son it was, right? Because they're sons of Isaac. And they consider this to be uh, the chosen lineage of Ibrahim a.s. Right? For the Christians also it's very important because this is a typology of uh, God murdering his own son, Hashadillah. Right? And Isaac is a forefather of Isa a.s. So it's very important for them. And sometimes Muslims have fallen into the trap of this kind of discourse where we start comparing prophets. You know, Ismail is better than Isainas. Astaghfirullah. In our prayers we send blessings of peace. Wa ala ali Ibrahim. Right? On the family of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Not just one side of the family, right? But on the entire family of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So there's an ikhtilaf. And major sahaba like Sayyidina Ali said it was Ishaq alayhi salam. Okay? So that's not a. Now Imam Suyuti says that the ayat in the Quran indicate Ismail. Okay? Because the story in the Quran, it doesn't name the son. And there's a hikmah in that, there's wisdom in that. This is not something we're supposed to wrangle over. It's not, it's not a big issue. But he says that the ayat in the Quran seem to indicate Ismail alayhi salam. And the story is in chapter 37 of the Quran. وَبَشَّرْنَاهُ بِغُلَامٍ حَلِيمٍ That we gave him glad tidings of a forbearing son. Right? And then the story is told where Ibrahim alayhi salam says to his son, he's not named, يَا بُنَيْ إِنِّي أَرَى فِي الْمَنَامِ أَنِي أَذْبَحُكَ فَانْذُرْ مَا تَذَرَى So he says, I saw in my dream, I'm sacrificing you. فَانْذُرْ مَا تَذَرَى What do you think about that? He wants his opinion about it. Right? Listen to the response of the son. He says, يَا أَبَتِ إِفْ عَلْمَا تُؤْمَرُوا Do what you've been commanded. سَتَجِدُنِي إِنْشَاءَ اللَّهُ مِنَ الصَّابِرِينَ You will find me, if Allah wills, patient. And then after the story, وَبَشَّرْنَاهُ بِإِسْحَاقِ نَبِيًّا مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ Then it says, then we gave him glad tidings of Isaac. Right? A prophet from the righteous. So the, the ayat in the Quran indicate that it was Ismail alayhi salam, but there is a khilaf about that. Okay? And then he goes on to mention that, uh, that both sons bury their father in Hebron in Palestine, which seems to indicate that there was no animosity in the family. Right? And then Esau marries two daughters of Ismail alayhi salam. In fact, Musa alayhi salam, according to the Torah, Musa alayhi salam's first wife, Zipporah, was the daughter of a Midianite priest. She was an Arab. So he married from Arabs. Right? But the way that, you know, sometimes our, our religious friends, our, our friends from different religions want to present the issue, is that there's great animosity. And there's always been animosity between Israelites and Arabs. Right? <clears throat> so that's important. Um, and then he tells the story of Safa and Marwa, the well of Zamzam, the building of the Kaaba. Um, and then he says, he quotes a hadith from the Musnad of Abu Isa al-Tirmidhi about al-Hajjul al-Aswad, 
that it descended from paradise whiter than snow, but the sins of man turned it black. Right? It doesn't mean someone who's black is sinful or anything like that. It's nothing to do with skin color, right? We can't read into these things. And then he, he quotes from uh, the Dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam, which is Al Baqarah, from 127 to 129. So this was the Dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam uh, at the Bayt Allah in Mecca. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa idh Ibrahimu wa Ismailu Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta al-sami'ul alim Ibrahim and Ismail alayhim as-salam they raised the foundations of the house right they raised the what qawa'id min al-bayt the asas of the bayt in other words the foundation was there so the uh, mufassirin of the Quran say that uh, that the foundation of the Kaaba was laid down by Adam alayhi salam okay uh, and then the flood after the flood of Nuh alayhi salam, the walls of the Kaaba were destroyed and the foundation was left. So then they raised up the foundations again at the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Okay. And uh, if you keep reading this section in verse 129, uh, he says, Rabbana wa fihim, O our Lord, raise amongst them Rasulan minhum yatlu alayhim ayatik. A messenger who will rehearse upon them your signs. Will teach them the book and wisdom. And purify them. You are the great and the most wise. Right? So there's a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, I am the prayer of Ibrahim Alayhi Salaam. Or the answer to the prayer. And the uh, the Bushra, the good news of Isa alayhi salam, right? Because the word uh, gospel or Injil uh, is a Greek word. Uh, actually, means good news, right? I am the good news of Isa alayhi salam, right? So this is the point of the gospel of Isa alayhi salam, is to give uh, Bushra of the coming of the apocalyptic. Messenger of God or the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Um, then he uh, he says here. Let's see here. Yes. So there's three types of Arabs. Okay. Um, do we have an eraser here? The first time is called. Al-Arab al-Ba'idah. Al-Arab al-Ba'idah. Okay, so these are ancient extinct Arabs. Okay, so these are the Ad of Hamud, right? The people of Aram. So, uh, we had said last time, let me do a race this. We said last time that Nuh had a son named Sam, right? And from Sam you have the prophet Hud eventually and Saleh, who are sent to Ad and Samud respectively. These are ancient ex extinct Arabs, right? They're extinct, right? Al Arab al Ba'ida. Okay. Alam tara kifa fa ala rabbuka bi'ad irama that il imad. Right. Um that's a khala khair. Uh I visited the grave of Hud alayhi salam. It's uh it's in Hadramaut. And it's a really amazing. There's this huge barren valley, there's no green, and then you go up this mountain and halfway up the mountain there's a little dome here. And that's the, the qabr. It's accepted by consensus of Hud alayhi salam. That's the first type. The second type uh, are called the Qahqaniyun. A 
And these are the descendants of Jorhum. Descendants of Jorhum and the Himyarites. So these are Arabs from Yemen. Okay. And it says here that uh, that Allahu Adam, there was an ancestor from the Jorhumites named Ya'rob who taught Ismail how to speak Arabic. Okay. So the word Arab actually Araba, um, in its etymology, means to move around, something that's always moving, right? Like uh, inflection in Arabic, in grammar, is i'rab, uh, right? Inflection, how the endings of words are dynamic in Arabic, right? They're always changing. Ja'a ar-rajulu, ra'aytu ar-rajula, marartu bi rajuli. The ending is always changing. This is called i'rab, it's always moving. Because the ancient Arabs are always moving around. Okay? So, and then it says here that Ibrahim alayhi salam was born in Iraq. It's called the Ur of Chaldees. So it's important to note here that Ibrahim alayhi salam was not a Jew. Okay, sometimes you'll find that in encyclopedias, that he was a, a, Jew, a, a Jew, right? And uh, scholars of Judeo-Christianity don't accept that either. Uh, he was in fact a Hebrew. Okay, so the word Hebrew. So Shem had a great grandson. So Sam, right, is one of the sons of Noah. Had a son named Eber. And Eber, this comes from a root. Abara ya'buru erbur. Abara means to traverse or to cross over something. Like there's a river here, you cross over. Abara, right? You cross over. Right? So this is the root of Ibriya, of, of Hebrew. It simply means someone someone who crossed over a river. Okay? So this is not a religious distinction any more than Arab is. Someone who moves around. These aren't these aren't spiritual distinctions. The Quran is very clear. Makan Ibrahim Yahu. Yahudiyan, wala Nasraniyan, wala kin kana Hanifa Muslima, wa makana min al Mushrikin. Ibrahim alayhi salam was not a Jew or a Christian, but he was a Hanif, he was a monotheist, true in faith, and he did not worship idols. Okay? You find many verses in the Quran like this. In awla nasi bi Ibrahim, la ladina ittabauhu, wa hadha nabi wa ladina amanu. Verily, those who are closest to Ibrahim alayhi salam are those who follow Ibrahim alayhi salam. As are this prophet and those who believe, meaning Sahaba and the Muslims. Okay. Um, in other verses as well. Now, the Hunafa, right? So we have this group in Hijaz called the Hunafa. So Karen Armstrong in her Sirah. She mentions four of them very early. She mentions Uthman ibn uh, Huwayrith, Ubaidullah ibn Jahash, Waraka ibn Nawfal, and Zayd ibn Amr. Now Zayd ibn Amr is uh, significant. He was a man who lived before the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He lived in Mosul for a while, and he was and he consulted with ulama of Christians, and he was moving around the area, and he was told to go to Hijaz for a Prophet's time was imminent. To, to come out of Hejaz. So as he's moving south th uh, through Syria, he's killed in South Syria. He was ambushed by a b bunch of brigands and they kill him, right? Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu said that he will come on a day of judgment as a nation unto himself. Now his son, uh, Sa'id ibn Zayd, radiallahu anhu, is one of the most celebrated companions of the Prophet Sallallahu And he's from the Ashran Mubashirin bil Jannah. He's from the 10 promised of paradise. Sa'id ibn Zayd uh, was the husband of Fatima uh, bint Khattab. Uh, she was a sister of Umar. And it was the famous story, of course, when uh, Sayyidina Umar converted, right? Fatima was in the room with her husband, right? Sa'id ibn Zayd, and there was a scribe there. Uh, and then Sayyidina Umar heard the Quran, Surah Taha. So this is the Sa'id we're talking about. His father was a Hanif, a monotheist. So these Hunafa claim to be of the religion 
of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Right? Now, Ismail alayhi salam, he marries from the Jurhumites. So his second wife was uh, from the Jurhumites. And they become the caretakers of Mecca, which leads us to the third type of Arab, al Musta'iba. So, these are people who became Arabs by learning the Arabic language. Like Ismail alayhi salam, like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. He's considered from the Musta'ariba. Not the ancient Arabs, not the Jurhumites. Okay. Become Arab by tongue. Now in chapter 2, he calls it a great loss. So this is the loss of the Bi'ru Zamzam. So the Jurhumites, uh, they begin to oppress the Hajjaj, the, the pilgrims. Right? So they're driven out. They bury the well. They bury the well of Zamzam and the treasure that was in the well. So the Kaaba at the time, according to the ulama, um, was only about six feet tall all the way around. And there was no roof. So people would go in and steal things. Right? It was very easy to break into the Kaaba. Um, so they buried the well. They took the treasure and buried it on top of the well. Um, now the Khuza'a become the leaders of Mecca. The Khuza'a are Arabs descended from Ismail alayhi salam that went to Yemen but then returned to north. Okay? And they didn't make an attempt to dig it up. And this is when Hubal was brought, the Moabite idol was brought into Mecca and the Bani Israel stopped making their, their Hajj. Now, chapter 3 he calls Quraysh of the Hollow. And Armstrong and Watt have similar chapters or they have these trees. So if you look in the back of the book here, if you have a book, it would really help. Um, in my book, it's, it's there's no page number, it, but it would be 347. It might be in the, yeah, in the green editions, it's at the beginning, which is probably better. So it's towards the beginning. It's called Quraysh of the Hollow. Right? So, again, Quraysh is the Qabila. Right? That's the tribe. And then there's 14 clans. A clan is called the Fakhid, which means a thigh. Right? There's 14 thighs. All right? 14 uh, clans in one tribe. Now, he says here that this is Quraysh of the Hollow. There's also Quraysh of the Outskirts, uh, which he doesn't mention here. These are kinsmen that lived on the countryside. All right? So he begins here by saying, uh, by noting Fihr, who's known as Quraysh first. Okay? So Fihr ibn Malik. Quraysh is kind of like a nickname. So this is the name of the tribe. He has two sons, Ghalib and Al-Harith. And he also says down at the bottom in the footnote that anytime you see a name with bold or capital letters, all caps, it's the founder of a clan. So there's Bani Harith, right? That's the name of one of the clans. And it says here, this is the clan of Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who's also one of the ten promised of paradise. At the Battle of Uhud, it was Abu Ubaidah who pulled the rings out of the cheek of the Prophet wasallam. So the, the Prophet was wearing a helmet, and there was rings, the iron rings that were supposed to protect his jawline. And he, w he was struck on the face by a man named Ibn Qami'ah, and they penetrated his flesh, and he pulled them out with his teeth. Abu Ubaidah, he lost his two front teeth in the process. And then some of the blood of the Prophet went down his throat, and the Prophet told him, it's haram for your flesh to be consumed by the fire. So this is Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah. He's called Aminu Hadi al-Ummah, the trustee of this Ummah. Now if you look on the other side, you have Ghalib, right? Who's 12 men removed from Adnan. His son Lu'ay, 13 men removed. Lu'ay has two sons. Amir, this is the clan of Suhail. Suhail was the one that the Quraysh sent to Hudaybiyah. Right? And we'll get to all these stories. So this is the one that negotiated the treaty of Hudaybiyah. The, the, the treaty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls a manifest victory. Right? Suhail. He didn't uh, become Muslim until after the Ghazwat Hunayn. Uh, the other son, Ka'ab, is 14 removed from Adnan. He has three sons. You have Murrah, which is in the line of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
you have Adi. So this is the clan of Umar, Sayyidina Umar, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Bani Adi. And then you have Husayis, who has two sons, who has one son, Amr, and he has two sons, and both of his sons are founders of clans. Bani Saham and Bani Jumah. Bani Saham is the clan of Amr ibn al-As. Right? So Amr ibn al-As is the man the Quraysh sent to Abyssinia right, to debate the Muslims uh, <clears throat> with regards to the role of Isa alayhi salam. Right? So he debated Ja'far ibn Abi Talib in the court of the Najashi, Amr ibn al-As. Uh, he was a very brilliant politician. Uh, he also founded the city of Fustat, which became Al-Qahira, Cairo, Egypt. And his masjid is still there. It's the, it was the first masjid on the African continent. And I've had the pleasure of visiting the masjid of Amr ibn al-As in Fustat. Um, very beautiful masjid. Uh, the other son, Jumah, this is the clan of Uthman ibn Mad'un, who was a cousin of Umar. And Uthman is the one who accosted the poet Labid. Um, so we'll read in Sirah, it's coming up in the Meccan period, there was the famous poet Labid, the Sha'ir, right? And Uthman is the one who, and he was known for his, uh, he was a Zahid, he was uh, someone who renounced the dunya. And then if you go back to Murrah, he has three sons, Kilab, who's in the lineage of the Prophet Wasallam, on the ancestry, 16 removed from Adnan. Then you have Taim, which is the clan of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, and Talha ibn Ubaid Allah. And both of these are from the Ten Promise of Paradise. <clears throat> and then you have Yaqaba, who has a son, Makhzum. This is a very important clan. The clan of Abu Salama and Khalid ibn al-Walid, who is called Sayfullah al-Maslul, the drawn sword of God. This is also the clan of Abu Jahal. Right? Abu Jahal is the Ra'asul Mustahzi'in. He is the, uh, the head of the ones who used to abuse the Prophet wasallam. Not, not a single one of, not a single mustahzi became a Muslim, right? So going, disbelieving in him is one thing, but other uh, people who eventually became Muslim, Abu Sufyan and uh, Amr ibn al-As, uh, and even Ikrama ibn Abi Jahal, they did not believe in the Prophet wasallam, and they fought against him, but they never mocked him, right? Never made fun of him, right? But Abu Jahal used to do that, and there's a few of these men, none of them became Muslim. They were either killed in battles or they died from disease. And then Kilab has two sons, Qusay, of course, who is called the king of Mecca, the founder of Darul Nidwa, and Zuhra, uh, Bani Zuhra, which is the clan of the Prophet's mother, Amina bintu Wahab, and his cousin Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas, who is from the Ten Promised, and Abdurrahman ibn Auf, he's also from the Ten. <clears throat> and then Qusay has four sons, Abdul Uzza, who has Asad, so Bani Asad is the clan of uh, Asayda Khadija al-Kubra bintu Khuwaylid. This is the first wife of the Prophet sallallahu And also as Zubair ibn Awam, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He's also from the promised ten. He has a son named Abd, Abdul Manaf and Abd dar We'll get to their story in a minute. And then Abdul Manaf has a son, uh, Hashim. Right, who's 19 removed from Adnan. He has three brothers, Nawfal, the clan of Mut'im ibn Adi. Right, so this is, uh, Mut'im is the person, one of the five, when the Quraysh had a boycott on Bani Hashim in the late Meccan period, that no food was allowed out to them. Right, Mut'im was one of the five who protested that. Right, he also gave the Prophet protection upon the Prophet's return from Ta'if. <clears throat> um... And then you have Abdu Shams, this is a clan of Uthman ibn Affan, Abu Sufyan ibn Harb. This is Bani Umayyah. It's a very important clan. Uh, there's, uh, that, um, that comes in, uh, into, into more importance after the passing of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Bani Umayyah was the, uh, was the Muslim polity for a while. They were overthrown by the Abbasids. <clears throat> and then Hashem has Abdul Muttalib, who's also called Shaybutul Hamd. And then Abdul Muttalib has at least ten sons and many daughters, right? <clears throat> Including Abu Talib and Abdullah, who is the father of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So that's the that's the diagram here, Quraysh of the Hollow. 
Now, if you look at the, some of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, yes? Question. Yes? Is there a relationship between the tribes you just mentioned and the various readings of the Quran? Yes. So, <clears throat> according to our tradition, according to sound hadith, uh, the Quran was revealed in seven dialects. Okay? And some say there's even more. So, the Prophet ﷺ would receive the wahi in seven, at least seven, some say up to ten dialects. And all of them are correct. And he would speak uh, to, to the tribe in their dialect. <clears throat> okay? That's why you have different ways of reading the Quran. Okay? <clears throat> so, something to remember is that our belief as Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah is that uh, Arabic uh, is itself something that's created. It's a, it's a created language. Right? <clears throat> so when we say that the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not created, it's uncreated. Right? That's our position. In contrast to Mu'tazilites who said it was created. Our position is uncreated. We're not talking about uh, sawt, wal huruf, wal kalimat, wal logha. We're not talking about sound and words and letters and languages. These things are created. When we refer to the uncreated kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're talking about the infinite meanings of the Qur'an. And there's different ways of articulating those infinite meanings. Okay? So you have uh, multiple readings of the Qur'an. A lot of Muslims don't know this. We don't have variant readings. The Bible has variant readings. In other words, there's, there's verses that are missing in different versions of the Bible. That's a variant reading. That's a version. Right? We don't have different versions of the Qur'an. Right? But we have multiple readings. There are some who read Maliki Yawm din and some say Maliki Yawm din Right? <clears throat> and it's just a difference of an alif. Is he the king or the owner of the Day of Judgment? Now, the ulama say both are correct because the Prophet ﷺ, through Sanad, recited them both ways. And in the Quran itself, Allah is the king and the owner. So both of those meanings are found in the Quran anyway. So the ulama have said that the reason why we have multiple readings uh, is uh, a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He's given us more insight to the pre eternal meanings of the Quran which are infinite. The pre-eternal meanings of the Qur'an are infinite because they have to be infinite because it is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's an attribute, qualitative attribute. Okay? Um, so yeah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and this is, this is one of the, uh, the wisdoms of da'wah, is that you speak to people in, uh, according to their understanding or language. Okay? Uh, so that's what the wise person does. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, he, would employ, he would employ that. Right? So when he went to, before he went to Medina, he would send Sahaba to go into Medina and learn the adat of the people, the habits of the people there, right? So he can tailor the da'wah, right? So yes, there's, there's, uh, multiple readings of the Quran. Um, Uthman, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he canonized the Quran in the Qurayshi dialect, right? So the Qurans we have now, most of them are in the uh, Qureshi dialect, what was being recited in Mecca at the time. But there's different ways of reciting it. Um, so I hope that answers the question. But I was going to mention about the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. You look at his wives, and this is something that, uh, like the, uh, the, the Muslim hater, right, he'll always bring up, right, this issue of polygamy. If you look at the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, something that we have to realize is that all of his wives came from different tribes, right? So there's, there's a great wisdom behind this. This is not something that's haphazard, right? He's choosing specific women, and it's not his choosing. We don't believe that the Prophet ﷺ was guided by hawa, by his caprice or desire. That this is, a, a, all of these are by command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Khadijah is from Bani Asad, Aisha is from Bani uh, Taim, Hafsa Bani Adi. Right. Um Salima Bani Makhzum, Juwayriya Bani Mustariq, Um Habiba Bani Umayya, Sufiya Bintu Huyay is uh, Bani Nadir, Bani Israel. Right? She's from a Jewish tribe. Uh, Maria Al Qiptiya, Mary the Copt from Egypt. Right? So there's a reason, there's a great wisdom behind this. Right? So we don't, we don't ascribe baser motives to the Prophet. Sallallahu Right. <clears throat> now, 
We have to what time? Ten? Okay. So we'll go another five minutes in inshallah and then we'll see if there's comments or questions. If you have a question or something you, you can ask me. You don't have to wait. So there was a strong uh, allegiance to the tribe. This is very important amongst the Jahali Arabs. Allegiance to the tribe. Okay, so they practice this type of tribal utilitarianism. In other words, uh, do whatever is best for your tribe. It wasn't even seen as immoral to go out and kill someone from another tribe. Okay, it was only immoral to do something negative to someone from your own tribe. So uh, this was so basically, law and order was impossible. It was probably the harshest environment on earth, right? And the Prophet sallallahu and this is part of the miracle of who he was, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, is that he was extremely gentle, right? So you're dealing with like almost polar opposites, and the, and how he was able to bring uh, this type of environment under control is really a miracle in and of itself, right? And one of the reasons why, like we mentioned earlier. A major reason why was his choice of marriages, because you have clans that are at each other's throats, that are always going back, you know, revenge killings, back and forth. And then he marries from both clans, and suddenly they're kin to the Prophet, they're related to him. So the, suddenly they put the swords down, right, and they're at peace. So one of the major factors as to how he was able to bring peace to the region was through his marriages, right. Um, so uh, the ulama talk about muru'a, which is uh, the moral ideal of the time, which is manliness, protection of the weak, generosity, hospitality, loyalty. Uh, so Islam took this concept and expanded it from tribalism to universalism. So Islam is a universal religion, right? It's not a tribal religion. This is extremely important. Um, like the word... Uh, the word Judaism comes from a tribe, right? Um, the word Christian comes from Christ, right? There's a, there's a figure named Christ who's a human being. Um, but the word Muslim, uh, we believe, uh, transcends any one person, transcends the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because Ibrahim alayhi salam, according to the Quran, is a Muslim, right? And this was before the time of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, so we have to stress this this aspect of our religion. You know how the Christians are always quoting John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world and so on and so forth, right? This is like their, uh, their, um, the, the, uh, the bread and butter, right, of the, of the evangelist, right? It's a very beautiful verse and, uh, and they always tell you to read John's gospel first, you know. Even though it was the last one written, read it first because in this gospel there's, Theological discourse of, of Jesus about his own nature and how he's divine and things like that apparently So our verse should be 21 107. This is our bread and butter Surah Al-Anbiya, ayah number 107 right? This should be, we should, I don't know, I was going to say tattoo it, but it's haram we should, <laughs> I don't know, just um, make a bandana or something, I don't, I don't know This We should always be quoting this verse And it's amazing uh, the ignorance of, of educated people and they're masakin, you know, they're not any, we, we feel bad for them because they're so, because the ignorance is so rampant, even amongst our Muslim youth. They don't know that about the Prophet Sallallahu I did a five minute talk at a church one time, five minutes on, uh, the, 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 the Bedouin urinating in the masjid, right? Just one simple story. Of the Bedouin yearning and the Muslim. And this girl came up to me and she was a Christian and she was crying and she wanted to hug me. And, you know, and, and she was like, I can't believe it. This is beautiful. And no one ever told me this. And how many times have you heard that story? You've probably heard it a thousand times, right? It's just something that is, we, we hear it a lot. It's, it's, but we're not, we're not involved in a discourse so people don't know these things about the Prophet, right? Because they have no reason to disbelieve what's being told to them by their teachers. In school, in the university, I mean, he's a professor, he's got a PhD in comparative religion, he must be intelligent, why would he lie to me, right? Uh, but that's, 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 the, that's the problem, is that we need to study under teachers who have sanad, who have transmission, right? And that's, what's, that's the secret of this ummah, is the sanad, according to Abu Bakr ibn Arabi, is, is, is connecting yourself from, with people who study under people, who studied under people, who studied under people, who studied all the way back to the Prophet 
that's when you'll get the essence of the deen or the fiqh. The fiqh, uh, you know, we, sometimes it's, we translate, you know, fiqh as jurisprudence, but it, it really means the essence. And the ulama have said, it's the, it's the smell of the rose. That's the fiqh. Without the rose, without the smell of the rose, what do you have? You know, you, you're missing the essence of the rose. Right? Um, so that's why we need people with uh, deep knowledge that, have trans, that has transmission um, in order to convey the message in an adequate way. <clears throat> or else you're left with, you know, just a very uh, superficial type of... And, you know, it's important to do presentation. You know, these are the five pillars and so on and so forth. And, you know, people find these types of things... I mean, it's, it's very helpful, but it's useful, but it's very dry. We're missing the spirit of it, right? We have to come up with the spirit to find the spirit, right? Um, so I'll stop at that point. Next time we'll talk about... Uh, we're going to talk about uh, Husay and uh, his sons, uh, and we're going to get into, uh, inshallah ta'ala, Amul Fil, the year of the elephant. Okay, so read those chapters of the book. Read the next few chapters, very short chapters, inshallah ta'ala. So, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's where uh, the, um, it's it, the first few classes of this uh, topic. We're kind of setting things up, so it's kind of historical. It's, it might be a little boring for children, but once we get into the Sira, right? Um, I think they'll uh, enjoy it more. I hope people aren't bored. I mean, this, this is this is this is a this is a class we have to. I mean, it's not, like I said, it's not it's supposed to be entertaining. I hope it's entertaining. I'm entertained. <laughs> Is there a question here? Yes. Yeah. A Latin West or Rome? Yes. The Surah Rune, which one? Which one? The Surah Rune, the Quran. Oh, that's, yeah, that's, that's referring to uh, Byzantium, uh, the Greek East. East. Yeah, the Greek East. Yes. <clears throat> uh and then 10, in 1054, they split completely the Greek East and Latin West. And now you have Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodox. That's where that, that's the origin of that. Okay. And the whole issue was, you know, the Pope. Is the Pope infallible? The Catholics believe he's masum in his doctrine. And the Pope, a couple of years ago, he made a comment about the Quran, which is completely incorrect. So obviously he's not. He said that uh, the verse in the Quran, "La ikraha fi din," is mansukh. It's abrogated. And the reason he said that is he said he said that because it was revealed in Mecca, and it was replaced by "Ayatul Saif," uh, the verse of the sword revealed in Surah Tauba. But "La ikraha fi din" is in what surah? Is in Al Baqarah, right? Which is revealed in Medina, not in Mecca. So. Uh, I've never come across a classical exegete of the Quran who's ever said that there's no compulsion in religion is abrogated. I don't know where he got that from. But he's supposed to be a masum pope who made a major blunder. <laughs> Any comments or questions? They don't have to be related to the topic. <laughs> yes, he eventually became Muslim. Ahmad ibn al As, um, he converted late in the Medinan period. Um, he, after the passing of the Prophet وسلم, he was the arbitrator for Muawiyah against Imam Ali. Um, so there were some issues after that, right? And uh, Amr ibn al-As is the one who said to his son when he was on his deathbed, he said, Ya Bunayya, he said, oh my dear son, his son's name was Abdullah. He said, there was a time where I hated the Prophet so much, I couldn't look at him. Uh, I mean, uh, I hated the Prophet so much, I was fighting many Ghazawat against him. And then there came a time where I loved him so much, I couldn't look at him in his face. And if you ask me what he looked like, I can't even tell you, because I don't even remember what he looked like. Because after I converted, he was so ashamed to look at the face of the Prophet because he fought against him for so many years. That he just didn't want to look at his face. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Yes. It's kind of a side question. Um, the concept of the light of the person who lost the world is something that Krishna created. Is that yes. also the Mathurudi and the Hari opinion as well? Um, that's a minority opinion in the Mathurudi school. It's an acceptable position, uh, unless it's an old, there's some ultra orthodox Mathurudis, uh, Mathurudis that will condemn it. Um, but it's an acceptable position. But it's mostly found amongst the the Asharis. Um, because the reason it's accepted uh, is because either way, the Prophet ﷺ is from the Makhluqat, he's created. Right? So some sometimes uh, people will say, you know, they'll quote the hadith, don't do to me what the Christians did to Isa. ﷺ. But in order to understand that hadith, we have to understand what did the Christians do to Isa. ﷺ. What, they, what did they do? They made him uncreated and equal to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the priority of the Muhammadan light, uh, or the reality of the Muhammadan nature, those who adhere to that belief, none of them are saying that the Prophet ﷺ is uncreated. They call him Khayr al-Khalqillah, which by the way is also standard Maturidi doctrine. Um, but there's there's Dala'il that uh, the Ash'aris will use from the Qur'an. Like, that, like the verse we quoted from uh, Al-Ahzab, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا مِنَ النِّبِينَ مِثَاقَهُمْ وَمِنْكَ We took a covenant from the prophets, from you, and then from Noah, Ibrahim, Musa, and Isa. Now why is the Prophet ﷺ mentioned first, and then Noah, Ibrahim, Musa, and Isa? According to the Ash'ari exegetes, it's because the Prophet ﷺ actually predates them in time, uh, in his temporality. He has ontological precedence. Because his ruh was created before they, before they were created, before their arwah were created. But either way, it's created. If someone says the Prophet ﷺ is uncreated, this is kufr, right? Um, like what the Christians said about that's what the Christians said about Isa ﷺ. So we have to understand, you know, what did they, what did the Christians say about Isa ﷺ in order to condemn other Muslims? If we don't know what they, what they did to him, then we can't condemn. And in this position, both are accepted. So there's no, there's no inkar where there's an ikhtilaf. You cannot condemn another Muslim position where there's an ikhtilaf and it's a valid ikhtilaf, a valid difference of opinion. Yeah, Ibn Taymiyyah was, he was very, uh, he, um, very critical to say the least of this position of the Ash'aris. <laughs> But he's a, we respect Ibn Taymiyyah as a great scholar, great scholar, and a teacher of Ibn Kathir. Right. Yeah, question? Yeah. So read the next few chapters, inshallah. Um, I may just quiz the youth next time <laughs> based on this class or based on the reading. It'd be very easy, you know, what are the three types of Arabs? Come on. That's easy. No, that'll be very easy, inshallah. So if you don't want to be embarrassed, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> you know, that's, that's how I learned to read the Quran. My teacher would imply uh, humility. And it's very effective. Very effective. When I was 18, 19 years old, you know, he would call you out in, in the crowd and he'd make you read. And if you didn't do your homework, you were. I've seen people sweating on the Mus'haf, dropping sweat on the Mus'haf because they're so... They're so <laughs> embarrassed, but it works, you know. But it usually doesn't work in amongst Americans. They don't like that tactic. Allah <laughs> <laughs>